Lord, we just thank you for helping us some more. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the awakening that you're doing of your sons and daughters as to the expanded dimensions of the kingdom we are to manifest and receive here on earth and that you are even shaking everything that can be shaken so that which cannot be shaken will remain and we are here we are receiving you say in hebrews 12 an unshakable kingdom that becomes part of our mission we thank you for that lord in jesus name we pray amen all right we're going to get started in the first of the mountains we're going to go through the spiritual landscape of the mountains, and we're going to uh, hopefully help you understand a little better um, your assignment, what the enemy's doing, and therefore what our role and our, and, our, and our mission becomes. And as we go through these mountains, there is value for you hearing about it, even if you don't think this is your specific mountain of interest. One of the ways you begin to know that it is your mountain of interest is as you hear about it, if your heart begins to ignite with fire, you begin to know that, oh my goodness, I am called to this mountain. And you can be called to a mountain in multiple different capacities. For instance, the mountain of government we're speaking of now, you may be called to the mountain uh, of government as a financer, as an intercessor, or as a uh, you know, traditional politician, you'll say. And so there's different ways you can show up. Now we're just going to go again, part of the, the reminder as we go into the mountain of government is a list of seven mountains of society just so we can uh, get used to being aware of them. And there's government, education, media communications, economy, business, family, celebration of arts and entertainment, and religion worship and again that's the one we've been used to operating that is uh, the mountain where the church is and this becomes uh, a primary value of this seven mountain message in that statistics bear out and tell us that only one percent of church congregations and memberships have a traditional ministerial role they're behind the pulpit that they are uh, even in the choirs, children's ministry, whatever, and only a maximum of 3% will ever have a ministerial position. And so that leaves 97% feeling like they are or you are secondary class citizens in the kingdom of God because if God really wanted to use you, he'd have put you behind a pulpit. And part of what we're trying to erase is that thought, and, and we want to give you an understanding that these other mountains therefore represent platforms and pulpits that are not traditional. Your platform, your pulpit may be the mountain of government, may be the mountain of celebration. We are talking right now of the mountain of government, and you'll begin to understand and know that more. But the Lord desires for the other 97% of our congregations, of our churches, to be ignited into their mission field and to be active from Monday to Friday or more, whatever. That's the traditional work week. And so this becomes part of you uh, being aware of that. Now, Micah 4, 1 and 2, scripture we've pointed out in the first message. Many nations will come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. He will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. And we just want to take note of a moment for that part where it says his ways and his paths. This, again, goes beyond just the salvation sign on the dotted line. Want to make sure when you die, you don't go to hell. That becomes important. But this is about nations coming to the household of God for instruction on his ways and paths and how entire nations can function. I want to point out the scripture, Matthew twenty-two forty-four. 44. It says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. This is a scripture that I believe it's about seven times in the scripture. It's said for the very first time. It is uh, cited in Psalms 110. It's prophetically, when David saw it in Psalm 110, he was seeing hundreds of years in the future, a time when the Lord saying to my Lord, is the Father saying to the Son, sit at my right hand till I, have make, till I make your enemies your footstool. Again, this gives us some missional understanding about 
what we're here to do besides just getting people saved, just besides just trying to outlast darkness or beasts and false prophet and, and, and you know, all the stuff that Christians get afraid of. The Lord, the Father promised the Son. He said, listen, you paid the severe price. You changed everything by what you did on the cross. You did what you have to do. Now sit at my right hand in the New Testament elsewhere. It says he sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. But this until factor that you were reading about, till I make your enemies, gives us a point of eschatology, an understanding of the end times, doctrine of the end times, that he is not coming back until enemies, all of Jesus' enemies must be made his footstool here on earth. So again, he's not coming tonight because it hasn't happened yet. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 says, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So if you didn't get that clear, we are his feet. And there is a feet generation that will arise that will completely put the enemy asunder. The God of peace will crush Satan under our feet, not under his feet. We are not waiting for him to come back and do that, even though some are, but they're not supposed to be if we understand what Scripture is saying. He's not coming to die again. The blood didn't lack, you know, it, was, it wasn't 85% of authority and power's mind go therefore. It was all authority, power's mind, in heaven, on earth, go therefore. So the rest of it is us awakening to what has been done for us and us stepping into that. Now, Isaiah 60, you know, all three of the verses there are the most prophetically relevant about darkness and gross darkness covering the nations and the people that it doesn't follow up by saying, but don't worry, I'm coming to zap you out of it all. It says, but the Lord will arise upon you. The Lord will be seen upon you. His glory will be seen upon you. And the verse three gives a governmental dimension or light to the emphasis of how he's coming. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your shining. It speaks of a day, very well the day we're living in, where we can recognize the darkness and deep darkness. And there's almost this contradiction, irony, because it says darkness will cover the earth, but nations will come to your light. As we'll see in a moment, since in Spanish, nations will walk to your light. I like that translation, depending on what version of the Bible, it might already say that. But nations will walk to your light. He's saying, if the sons and daughters of the king arise enough, because we are to reflect his image of light, even in times of great darkness, entire nations can walk under the light of the sun, uh, of, uh, of the light of God. The sons and daughters of the king can walk to that level. And when it says kings will come to your brightness, the brightness of your shining, it's kings, prime ministers, presidents. It's giving a dimension of the light that will be upon us, light that reaches even into governmental places. I have myself walked into this. It was a, began as a surprise in 1999 when the Lord said, I want you to begin to reach the up and outers. And I, I said, Lord, I don't need that. He said, I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. I said, like, what? Do I ask to meet with the mayor of the next city I go to? And I always thought I was being funny. He goes, like, yeah. And so I met with the mayor, gave him some prophetic words, and everything happened, and there was all kinds of wealth and riches, and the whole city and the whole region really changed because of that. And, uh, and out of it, just uh, continued grace and favor, uh, there's been this privilege to meet and, 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 and interact with leaders in multiple nations. It's actually over 20 nations now where we've met, prophesied, uh, uh, spoken with either the, the pre somebody high in, in, in government there, the president, the prime minister, the general, the set of generals, the president of Congress, congressman, high level of government, that we have been able uh, uh, to speak to them and bring counsel of the Lord, the presence of the Lord. I had no idea I was meant to function in that level until the Lord said, I want you to begin to reach the up and outer, up and outers. I did not know that and really did find out that they were up and outers, that they're, they're in need of the light and presence we bring. A general of the armed forces of one nation, as we're meeting for the second or third time in his, in his nation, he says, Johnny, and he wasn't a believer at the time, he says, Johnny, you bring so much, he didn't know what to call it, so much spirituality. And he says, you see how intense and difficult it is here. If we don't have what you bring, we have to go to the witch doctors. And he said, can I have your number so I can just call you sometime? 
I said, sure. You know, General of the Armed Forces of the whole nation wants to, my, can he have my phone number so he can call to have peace? But I began to see this on a consistent basis. It is, they were not made to function on the tops of the mountains. We were. But we're comfortable at the bottom of the mountains with lesser results, surviving, wandering in the wilderness, hoping Jesus comes and zaps us out of this mess. So we have to get this new vision. That's why this is a forerunner message to wake up the body of Christ as to our assignment and our privilege. And in that, he wants some of you, I'm sure, in this room and those listening to understand you have a call in government. And, and, and you know, it can be important to, uh, to have gone to Harvard and get your degree in political science and all these things. Nowadays, in this day and age, it seems to be more important to have been an actor uh, in Hollywood or something like, like that. You know, there's, there's, you seem to be able to easily jump from one mountain to another mountain. That was the traditional way, is you actually get schooled in politics to go there. Now, if the media likes you, Facebook can make you president, you know? And so the rules have just totally changed for better or for worse. I can tell you that, uh, though I'm not recommending not being instructed and trained, in all the nations that we do have access and we are regularly called upon and, and, and asked to, give, uh, to visit and give counsel advice, it is not because of my uh, degree, because I don't have one, and um, it is because there is an absence of the word of the Lord, of what he's saying. Uh, um, you know, you go to Harvard, they don't quite tell you what to do today with certain problems. And there is general understanding of the landscape of, of government, but it doesn't really give you the insight you need. And you can literally feel, when, when I go, it is amazing. I am much more confident prophesying, hanging out in the highest places in government and nations than I am, let's say, giving prophetic words in the mall. That's where we're comfortable. That's where we're breaking through. Let's take the kingdom out there. And it's good. We should do that. Go out in the mall. I give words and I'm like, I don't know if I, I don't know if that's right or not. When I meet with the president, I'll look in his face and tell him something like this and what's going to happen. I know I'm right because I was made to function there. And what we'll begin to find is many of you who didn't know that. We have so much unused authority. We have so much unused authority because we just picture that, well, we're, we're hanging out here in the bottom somewhere. And I was like, what, what business do I have to do talking with political leaders? Now I don't think that anymore. I stopped there. You know, there's several nations where I have invitations. I've had invitations to come meet with the presidents. I've said, I used to think automatically I should say yes, 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 because what a privilege. But now I think I'm like, you know what? I don't, I don't, it's no big deal anymore. You just start realizing who really carries authority. And in some of those nations, I understand who's further down the line, who's coming. We're working with some people in the future who will be uh, presidents there. We're like, you know what? This president, if I go visit with him, I'm, I'm going to give him a bad word. And I might end up in jail. I don't want to do that. <laughs> so, heaven's government, Matthew 6.10. I pointed that out in our first session. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There is government light in heaven and it can function on earth through his partnering sons and daughters. We really want to understand that, that that, you know, particularly if you get into the, the niche of uh, right Republican whites, I guess, in the United States, government is bad, but government is not bad when it's run the way it's supposed to be run. And here we just, we want limitations on government because it tends towards corruption when there is not instruction from on high, when there's not sons and daughters of the king operating in it the way it's supposed to. But government, there is a glory to government. If you remember, each kingdom has a glory to its kingdom, a glory to the way it manifests. There is a glory of government and sons and daughters of the king can manifest it. Now we're going to go through each of these as I have uh, pointed out and we're going to give you this, I'll say the spiritual landscape of it, and, and just to help you in, in, in getting an, uh, you know, a, a, a basic grid for uh, who we're interacting with and, and how we're supposed to go about resisting the enemy. As I pointed out uh, in, the, in our very first the overview mandate, the mandate overview, the Lord, the template he gave me was from the seven enemy nations of the children of Israel of the promised land, the Perizzites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and, and all the ites there, that there was a corresponding uh, evil spirit principality um, to each one of those names. And, and even in what their names literally means, uh, as I researched, that is how the Lord gave me the template for understanding what were the seven head sectors, the seven mountains of society. 
And the enemy on the mountain of government is the Girgashites. Again, to get more understanding, more in depth on these things, we have to do some cursory uh, uh, touching of these subjects. The book, The Seven Mountain Prophecy, goes into it in a deeper way, but we'll just give you it, and you'll have to take my word uh, for granted. But the Girgashites represent corruption. And that was one of the enemies, greater and mightier than them, that they had to dispossess. And, and the principality on the mountain of government, I believe, is Lucifer, Lucifer himself. He goes for attacking and destroying the nations. His essence is pride and, and, and manipulation. And uh, again, I can't establish in depth, uh, but we are going to, in, in a cursory fashion, establish why I believe it is him and what, what he is doing. So Lucifer, with his essence being pride and manipulation, and the lies or the common demons he works with are demons of corruption. That becomes the simple mission that the enemy has on the mountain. Again, there's a, a simple mission they have to distort the face of God. There's basically a simple lie, a simple mission. The mission for demons and powers and principalities on the mountain of government is to bring corruption. Because corruption then makes it opposite the image of who God is. The servant spirit, the God of justice. And so now there is a distorted face of God and the kingdom uh, of, this, uh, of God cannot descend. We're going to get to that a little more in just, in just a moment. We want to see the scripture out of Isaiah 14, 12 through 16 about Lucifer being removed from government. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, you who weakened the nations. We see that that's his basic assignments to weaken nations. So he goes to the top and from a governmental position, he seeks to weaken the nations. There is a glory even of nations. Every nation has a potential glory, a potential destiny. Sons and daughters of the kings are to make that manifest of the king. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount. I will be like the most high. You see, he's in direct challenge of the throne of God. That's why we say he's the principality that is illegally operating in the mountain of government. And his essence is pride manipulation and he uses corruption, uses demons of corruption. Rest of that uh, scripture. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depth of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms? One day we will look at him when he is dispossessed and displaced of all the deceiving authority he has, and we will say, oh my goodness, he was no big deal. But he is a big deal as, as long as he can continue to deceive. Now, in understanding our mission on the mountain of government, there is a general principle for any mountain. Whatever mountain you are called to, the general principle is this. Whatever spirit the enemy operates in, we must come in the opposite spirit. So even by, if you're not sure of your assignment, you can look at what the enemy is doing, understand you must come in the opposite spirit of that. So he comes in pride and arrogance and corruption. So integrity and servant spirit is the way a son or daughter of, the God, of God must show up on that mountain. You lose authority when you operate in the spirit of what operates on that mountain. So the point is not trying to get technical Christians on these mountains. We've already had that. We've had Christians that are presidents in nations, even in South America, Central and South America, but they then began to behave and operate like the principality with the pride and the manipulation and corruption. Whenever you behave like the dem demonic forces there, whether you're a Christian or not, you are now advancing the other kingdom. This is a principle of all the mountains. It's not enough to be a Christian and be on there. Your Christianity, Jesus, come into my heart, will get you into heaven, but advancing the kingdom must happen in the character and nature of Jesus. It must be in restoring his face, and when we don't do that, we're not advancing the kingdom, whether we're officially a Christian or not. It was just something we want to remember as it relates to all, all the mountains. All right, we want to look at five antichrist influences of Lucifer. To the degree we see these claws in a deeper embedded way into our society, in the fabric of our laws and society, to that degree we can know that there is a significant anti-Christ influence of Lucifer operating that government. And uh, the five are these. 
Number one, it is anti-Semitic. It's working to destroy Israel. You say, why is that a big deal? Well, in God's overall plan, clearly established in the scriptures, you know, there's some things the Lord just didn't put there. There's mystery. Part of the reason for mystery is because he wants to surprise us in a good way. Part of it is that it's staying ahead of Satan. He doesn't know exactly what to do. You know, if he had known what Jesus being on the cross meant, he would have never allowed Jesus to be put on the cross. So the Lord stays ahead of him in multiple ways. But one of the things that is, he lets the secret out of the bag. In the scripture, he says he will not rest. Jesus, the Lord says he will not rest till Jerusalem is a praise in all the earth. And there is scripture after scripture after scripture of the redemption and restoration of Israel. So Satan knows that. So he has attempted time after time after time to wipe out Israel. That's why Hitler carried the strongest anti-Semite and anti-Christ spirit that we, we know about. And he, he was like, if he can wipe them out, see, from Satan's standpoint, if I eliminate all the Jews, then his plan can't work. And that's what he's doing. So he'll, use, he'll go into government, and from a governmental standpoint, he'll begin to get his claws there, and you'll begin to see nations make anti-Semitic declarations. There is a, there, this is a strong claw of the enemy right now all around the earth. There are, there are discussions in European nations that have been our friend, friends where they are talking about whether, you know, the existential right of Israel. Israel causes so much trouble being there, they should just move out of there. And in doing that, that becomes this, the first signal of the claw going there. It goes little, uh, you know, little by little, it goes to a deeper and deeper place. But we must recognize that as soon as you see an anti-Semitic force in government and influence coming there, that that is a sign of the claw of the Antichrist in that government. And we need Christians, yeah, praying, but activated in every way to get those things pushed out. Number two, the Antichrist influence of Lucifer in the mountain of government will be working to destroy true believers. So he's after the church. Why? Well, because he can read the Bible too, where it says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The God of peace will crush Satan under our feet. So he's like, He's got to try to wipe out, you know, his easier task is to wipe out, there's 14 million Jews around the world. Now he's got to try to kill 2 billion uh, Christians, and so he has different ways. It's like it's a, it's a huge task for him, but he has to restrict them and diminish them, and, and one of the main things he does is, you know, he'll go into seminaries and bring out doctrines that limit us, if nothing else, of, of what we're supposed to do. But Antichrist influence in the mountain of government, we will see things that discriminate all the way to directly persecute Christians. Number three, of the Antichrist influences of Lucifer in the mountain of government, working to destroy the next generation. That would be abortion laws and wars to tempt against a more anointed generation. He's working to destroy the next generation. He realizes the time he can, he can again, he's, he's brilliant enough in his own twisted way to, him, to tell that there is something differently wired about this generation. He's, he's always wants to kill and destroy, Satan does, but he does, he, he, he works even in, in, in laws that are, uh, uh, facilitate abortion, particularly in an excessive way. That becomes a manifestation of an antichrist influence of Lucifer in government. And we want to just know that. Number four, working to suppress women. As women are released into their true authority and into all the things that the Lord has for them, both in the church and out of the church, we will see uh, not only that, uh, that we will begin to be twice as powerful. You know, we've had a male-dominated world for so, for so long, and there have been more freedoms for women recently. It's not like, uh, you know, it's not just to, as some have said, well, we've been, you know, a society walking on one leg and now we finally get to walk on two legs. But the principle of the scripture, one puts a thousand to flight, two put 10,000. It's this, it's this exponential difference when women are freed up to manifest all their destiny God has given them both in church and in every sector of society. And one of the blessings of the seven mountain message for the women is if you're, you know, Churches, apparently a lot of denominations aren't going to change much of the, uh, of, uh, you know, if there's only 1% room for people in general in the body of Christ, there's even uh, one-tenth of 1%, you know, there's no room hardly for, for the women, except behind the scenes doing all kinds of uh, tiny, uh, you know, uh, in the eyes of the Lord they're big, but, you know, the men, men rule and dominate, you know, they're bringing in the kingdom and all this kind of stuff. Well, in society there's not this 
uh, restriction. And so some of the greatest leaders of nations in the coming days are going to be women. Women prime ministers, women presidents, and all that kind of stuff. Women mayors, congressmen, and, and, and we see that, you know, it was such a quandary for us in our own nation. It was just funny to watch evangelicals jump around because they were going for Sarah Palin because she's an evangelical and, and she's a believer. And so Sarah Palin, Sarah Palin, and, and, and somebody pointed out the hypocrisy in one editorial said, this, these are denominations getting behind Sarah Palin that don't believe a woman can preach in church. So she can be president of a nation, but she can't preach in church. Well, that's another uh, subject for another day. But the devil hates women from the very beginning. He hates out of your seed. This, your seed will crush him. There's a double manifestation application of that all the way from the garden. Satan was told that. And so we see even these, uh, these influences we're talking about now, you'll see in certain of the, of the, the darkened, uh, you know, some of the, uh, where the Prince of Persia is strong in, 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 the, in the dark Islamic cultures and nations, you will see all these manifestations. You'll see the anti-Semitic spirit. You'll, you'll see where Christianity is given no room to operate and manifest there under pain of death, many nations uh, in the, of the Arab nations. And you will see that uh, this thing, this, even these, uh, now they're training up, so, you know, they have soldiers that are, are kids that they'll conscript, but they also encourage them, the, the suicide bombing and things like that, even for kids to do is a manifestation of that spirit. And they particularly oppress women. I guess one of the biggest things, you go to a culture where the only window they allow for women is they're all covered with everything and there's just, it's like that's literally all they're allowed to just peer out of their, 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 their little space and they don't allow them to manifest the glory of God that is on them. All those things are going to change, though, is the good news. But that is something that happens. The enemy comes with his claws at a governmental level and those restrictions are brought at that level. Number five, the enemy and the mountain of government works to pervert sexual mores. And, 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 you know, there's adultery, homosexuality, all kinds of things because there are natural, practical judgments that come. We know from the scripture itself, it doesn't even mean that God has to choose to judge it. It's that sexual deviancy reaps its own bad fruit. It's just, it, it, it doesn't, there doesn't have to be God sending something against it. It reaps its own bad fruit all the way from destructive family to, uh, you know, AIDS and STDs and every other kind of thing, sexual, sexual deviancy Breaking outside of the pattern of what God has spoken, a marriage relationship, and those are the guidelines for where, the, those are the parameters where sexual behavior is supposed to take place between a man and a woman. You step outside of that, there is just some kind of distortion, death, anywhere from mental to physical uh, disease, all those things above that will just take place. It will be a fruit of itself. And so the enemy knows that is a way he's weakening a nation. He's weakening a nation because they're bringing judgment on themselves from their own behavior. And ultimately, they can bring judgment from God. We know the thing of Sodom and Gomorrah. There was where the Lord came and said, you know, the ground itself is crying out to me because of the excessive sin that is, that is happening here. So we want to just be aware if you're called to government, that one of your assignment in some way or another, a prayer, legislation, or whatever, and if I know people are going to just, the Lord, the Lord tells me right now, there's going to actually be multiple people who will hear this specific teaching who will be running nations in the future. And you, and you must know that your assignment is to not, to, to these talons of Satan, you push them out, you must not let them take place. And this thing of Israel, Israel will be an anvil, Back to point number one, is the anvil upon which the destiny of the nations will be beaten in the coming years and days. As you have done to Israel, so will be done to you. That's in the scripture and in the Bible. And, 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 and there is, uh, it's part of respecting and honoring God. This is, uh, again, there are books on this and there's another message for an hour on that, but that's what we can spit out in just one moment for now. So we've pointed out who the enemy is and what he's trying to do, but we never just exalt and magnify the enemy. We have a manifestation of the fivefold ministry. On each one of these mountains, the Lord showed me that there is a different, uh, uh, a, a, a different um, manifestation of what we know as a fivefold ministry. If you don't know what they are, as apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and pastors, those are called the fivefold uh, ministry. And we understand that they all have a role and mission on the mountain of religion in the church. There's a way they function in church, but there is a manifestation of them and where they show up in these other sectors of society. And anyone called to the mountain of government really has been given a mantle 
uh, of apostle, an apostolic mantle of the Lord, because an apostolic mantle carries displacing authority. A genuine apostle on the mountain of government will literally have tens of thousands of angels uh, that have been given to assist that person on the mountain of government for their assignment. And, and, and depending, as they, as they go higher and higher in their level, that will even go into the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of angels that are assigned to true apostles. And so true apostles carry authority and humility that displaces the darkness of this mountain. Remember, Satan comes in arrogance, so humility is the antidote to arrogance. You're here to serve, not to be served. So when you step into the, I'm being served, you're now running, you're advancing the other kingdom, whether you're officially a Christian or not a Christian. You just got to say that again. The kingdom of God must advance in the character and nature of God, and of Jesus. And so an authority carries authority and humility that displaces the darkness of this mountain. We must be servant-minded. Every time, even uh, in the scriptures, if we took the time to go there, you know, Jesus was called, he's the first apostle. He's the apostle of our faith. He's called an apostle in the scripture. And then there was the 12 apostles. Every time the apostles showed up in a city, they bumped up against government. They could feel it. Government that is there immediately feels the bump of the true authority that comes into town. That's just something that takes place. And so the powers and principalities feel, and they feel fear, and it's amazing because, you know, Jesus' disciples, they were these unlearned, they were the backwoods, rednecks, and didn't know how to speak well and all these kind of things, but they were scared to death of him because the anointing on them and the angelic cover around them told the powers and principalities, we're in trouble with these guys. They're shaking the whole thing. And so we want to understand that God does have mantles available for us. And, uh, and a mantle is about being known in heaven, not here on earth. So an apost apostolic mantle, you could be called to intercede on that mountain, carry great authority. Nobody knows about it in your church or anywhere else. It'd be nice in the future that we know these, know these things, but you can have great authority and nobody know about it except in heaven. You'll be able to tell as things change, you pray, and the Lord will let you know something has taken place. And, 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 and it's even, again, uh, that word humility, the word humility. If you have to tell people you're an apostle, you lose a little bit of your humility right there, which means you lose a little bit of your authority right there. Uh, you know, there's some practical reasons you can for growing church and things like that. But as it relates to what we're talking about, it is, you know, it's counterproductive on the mountain of government to let it be known you're an apostle on that mountain. But it's in, it's in my book on the seven, and the seven Mountain Prophecy, I wrote a, this chapter on this mountain of government, and I told that it, it really, in order to counter the powerful demons on that mountain, you really do need either uh, uh, to be working with an apostolic mantle, have an apostolic mantle, in order for the help from heaven to displace the enemy on that, on that mountain. It's in, in, it was... Uh, in a nation in South America, there was a congressman who read it, not even what we'd say a Christian believer. He was, uh, um, find out he really is a believer, but he was Catholic. And, 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 you know, the book, when I wrote it, I wasn't specifically thinking through that grid, even though more and more we've we found that it is, is reaching them and, and they, are, uh, they are being uh, blessed and using it very well. But he called me after reading it, already a high-ranking level congressman, and who many perceive will be a future president of that nation. And uh, he said, Johnny, he said, I was reading, reading your book in that chapter in the mountain of government. He says, it's exactly the way you say it is. It's exactly the way you say That's how it operates. That's how the enemy is. That's how things are. And, and he said, I just want, I wanted to, will you come to my country sometime and tell me if I, I have an apostolic mantle? Because I need it. And uh, it was just so unique. A guy already high-level congressman wants to know if he has an apostolic mantle. And it, it struck me as funny, but we went, did go to that nation. And while we're there, the Lord showed me he did. And as a sign, I took off my own coat and put it on him and, 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 and um, have spoken that he will be the a future president of that country. And these things will be common in the future. But, okay, I want to speak just a moment into how, uh, you know, when trying to figure out if you're called to government, I mentioned earlier already there's different ways to show up on this, on this mountain. You may be called to be a financier to support somebody. Um, but there are, 
you know, obviously many ways we could think of. You could be called to be a candidate. You could be called to be a congressman or congresswoman, a senator, an advisor, an aide, a law, lawmaker, a speechwriter, a, a, a cook. How about being a White House cook? A, a cleaner, intercessor. The idea with all these mountains is that we don't need just a hero, a pioneer hero, you know, oh, if we could get one of our own to the top of the mountain as a president. If he has no infrastructure working under him, it's just going to make his mission just miserable. We need to be like salt. You know, we're salt and light. Where we're just in everything. So we want to be at every level. We want to be the wisdom of mountain climbing is, is that you rope yourself. You know, you rope yourself to someone else. And so we want to have an infrastructure. Yeah, it would be nice to have a president, but then senators and congressmen, and again, the chauffeurs, the, the cooks, and, 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 and at every level of every, from the bottom of the mountain of government to the top, it's just so full of the presence of sons and daughters of the king who understand their mission that that mountain becomes transformed and reflects government of heaven. And that can happen. But again, it's different just being a Christian on there. I'll just keep it to myself. That's like having a light but keeping it turned off. And it's, well, I don't want to offend people by telling them they have to accept Jesus. You know, it's not about, you know, your mission on that mountain is not specifically to get people converted. It's to reflect the governmental face of God, which is a person, a man or woman of service and of integrity. So you go in servanthood heart and integrity and manifest that aspect, that face of God, and that, and that becomes our mission on that mountain. So governmental missions are to identify, deal with unrighteous institutions and unjust laws. This is our structural mission. I want to explain that. We have both a structural miss mission and a personnel uh, mission. Structural mission, I know there's some nations already, those operating in the Seven Mountain understanding, they're going and identifying and just looking, first of all, through existing laws and ordinances and just seeing what doesn't reflect the heart of God. The truth is, for many nations, in particular in our nation, the United States, many laws, many ordinances do reflect the heart of God. It, there may be people not operating in them correctly, but many do. So the idea is when we're talking about the systems of this world collapsing and shaking, there are some aspects in every mountain, things that do represent the heart of the Lord. They don't need to collapse. We want to identify that and not just be in there, we need to wipe everything out and put our own brand here. There are, there are good ones, so we want to recognize them and validate them, don't remove them, but we want to work to identify those things that are not from his heart and do begin to work to have them removed. And there's, again, there's uh, wisdom we have to receive and instruction. The greatest wisdom is to win the hearts and minds of people, first of all, before we try to go for the law. But some things, it's already the heart and will of the people. Just somebody hasn't done the, the you know, the, the step, the legal step, paperwork, uh, uh, um, to step forward and, and have this thing changed. Again, this, we're just saying these things real quick because of times, uh, for time's consideration. We want to seek to fill all possible positions with kingdom-minded individuals. I say kingdom-minded individuals as opposed to just Christians. I keep making this point. We have, a, we have a lot of technical Christians. We have two billion or more around the world, but we need to have kingdom-minded Christians, those who are walking in their assignment, those who aren't just wandering in the wilderness and the desert and say, oh, God, things are getting worse and worse and worse. When are you going to come and take us away from this mess? That's one brand of Christian. Kingdom-minded Christian is, all right. We are called to rise and shine. Your glory will be seen upon us. You're giving us the answers, the solutions, the strategies, the anointing for your face to be restored on planet Earth. And I'm here. I'm signing up. Help me. Use, use me. I'm here for you. And though that becomes a kingdom-minded believer. And so our personnel mission on the, on the mountain of government is to fill as many of these positions with those who think that way. So we have a structural mission and a personnel mission as it relates to this mountain. This scripture says, when the righteous govern, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. Again, there are believers that don't think that we have a right to even govern in society, that we stay out of that, we just stay on the mountain of the church. But this is a clear scripture that comes out of Proverbs, that when the righteous govern, the people rejoice, but when a wicked man rules, the people groan. We want to make a point that the focus of our authority, our dominion, is not 
over people. It is over dark powers. It is over distortion. It is over injustice. The people will rejoice. Papa is good looking. His ways are good looking. He is attractive. He is the desire of the nations, he calls himself. He's going to shake the nations so they will come to himself. So if we're manifesting a part of him that's not attractive, yeah, there could be some rebellion in people, but often we're just manifesting religiosity in something that doesn't reflect who he is. And our authority, again, is not to be, we're not here to take over people. We're here to take over darkness. We're here to be light, and we're here to be light and show up in government. Yes, governments manifest a lot of corruption and darkness. The number one reason is because sons and daughters of the king haven't shown up. Our biggest mission is show up. You know, light basically has to show up and darkness goes. It's not real sophisticated. We're giving you some ideas and some plan, but we have to show up. We have to invade that mountain. And so everyone that doesn't know, I don't know what I'm called to do. I've been for 10 years trying to figure out, I think I'm going to profit or I'm moving the gifts, but they don't make room for me in church. We got this whole mountain just ready for people, sons and daughters of the king. There's all kinds of spaces available. <laughs> Closing scripture. Isaiah 9, 7. His government on earth will be ever increasing. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. To order it and establish it with judgment and justice, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This will be how his government comes in, in an ever increasing fashion, rather than as a one day explosion. As his children awake, arise, and shine on this mountain. His government never stops increasing. So just, I just point that out. Of the increase of his government, his government will never stop increasing. This was a prophecy all the way from Isaiah. From the time the Prince of Peace shows up, his government will never stop increasing. The path of the righteous grows brighter every day until that perfect day, it says. So if, if in your eschatology you have, you know what, we're about to be squished out into the caves and, 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 and to the, you know, the recesses of society, that is not where this thing goes. Of the increase of his government, there is no end. And he says, I want to manifest my government through you, through you, sons and daughters. Now, just a quick prayer. If you feel that you are called to the mountain of government, some of you already know it, some of you here may already be there. And you can be called to multiple mountains. And in fact, the higher you go up on a mountain, the more you interact with other mountains. But if you feel that you are called to the mountain of government, either because you already knew that or there's some fire in you that's like, I'm thinking I'm supposed to be on this mountain. I'm just going to pray with you real quick. I just want you to stand where you are, not come up front, just stand where you're at. I just want to pray for you. And those who are in the various schools of ministry and, and watching this by video, do the same thing. Just stand up, do something different so that you identify that you're volunteering, saying, Lord, I'll carry your light. I can do that. I can carry light to the mountain of government. Lord, I just thank you for these that have stood up. And I ask that from this moment forward, everything in their life will change towards the better as it relates to their assignment. Wisdom, anointing, power, open doors, ideas, strategies, revelations, connections, I thank you, it really is happening right now. Everything is changing. This, them, their act of standing and saying, okay, I'm ready to rise on that mountain, however it is. And your assignment becomes wherever he opens a door, start there. Unless he makes it more specific, obedience is always number one. When you don't know, it's just get on there somewhere. Bring light. Understand your assignment, your mission, understand what the enemy is doing, and understand how you carry the kingdom there. I thank you, Lord, how you are invading the nations, even through this message that goes to the nations. I thank you for who you will raise up among the nations. I thank you for the new leaders, the new presidents, the new prime ministers, the new kings, the new generals, the new mayors, legislators, and every department of government of multiple nations. I thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.